Welcome to The Anxious Voyage. If you think that title sounds bleak or foreboding, one of two things must be true. You're very lucky or you need to get out more. On this program, we share stories of life and living. We compare notes. We discover commonalities. We accept that life is a glorious, heartbreaking thing, and we embrace and celebrate all of it. Take the ride with us. We're glad you're here. Now, here's your host, Mark O'Brien. Welcome. We are coming to you uh, again, and as always, from World Headquarters in Middletown, Connecticut, uh, birthplace of Lachlan Biff McGregor, who I'm sure you all recognize as the inventor of Scotch tape. Mm -hmm. um, I am uh, very happy to welcome my guests today, Sue and Craig James. Um, I've been lucky enough to meet them, well, first on LinkedIn, I think, and mm -hmm. then through mm -hmm. a number of video events in which we both participate. Um, so welcome to both of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you Thanks for, for having, having us. us. Um, I'm going to do things uh, in a completely opposite way from the way I usually do them. Um, I usually wait till the third segment to ask you about what you do professionally. <laughs> um, and it's part of what uh, actually intrigues me about the two of you. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason that I'm going to go about that differently today is, believe this or not, and I don't know if you have Netflix. I have we been did. watching the series, and I have one episode left called Mr. McMahon. Are you familiar with that? No. Je ne okay. sais pas. No. Uh, Vince McMahon is the Mr. McMahon in question, and he is the founder and may or may not still be involved in, depending on the status of his uh, various, various sexual scandals, um, the World Wrestling Federation, now known as World Wrestling mm. Entertainment. Okay. Mm. So the reason that I'm turning this show around today is that at the end of the last segment, which I watched last night, um, he was talking about the fact that his son, Shane, and his daughter, Stephanie, and his wife, Linda, who has run for Senate unsuccessfully at least twice, um, mm -hmm. have been very, very much involved in the business and also in the storylines. That is to say, what we see on television. But what Vince was saying at the end of last night's program was, if you start a business, do not ever get family involved. <laughs> so he, here the two of mm. you are uh, successful and quite evidently, at least to me, very happy. Um, so I would like you to talk about that if you don't object. And if, if that gets into Cat's Trat, all the better. So I guess I'll just open with this question. How do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> You're presuming we do it. <laughs> no, uh, you, your history suggests strongly that you do. Yeah, well, thanks, Mark, for the question. I'm going to do what I don't usually do and defer and try to let Sue lead this one. Wow. Um, it's life it's living it's it's we have always had very similar philosophies and thoughts and motivations and um maybe part of it is because here we go we met because of a corporate merger so we worked oh, together I love that. we both said i don't date anyone i work with i don't and then well you know so uh yeah, so we we had we knew how each other worked. I mean, we didn't work directly with each other. We were in different departments, but uh, we knew each other's habits, and we share. I mean, we would share everything that was going on, and uh, it was in IT. And you know, we'd sit at 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 a restaurant having dinner with the napkin and the pens out, and we're drawings 
things out. I mean, people had to think we were like, we're, no, we're talking about computer systems, okay? We're talking about companies, we're talking organizations. <laughs> wow, I love that. There are fiable geeks from the get-go. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I I can't I can't possibly be the first one to be struck by this term merger. Merger. It it wasn't it well Actually, it wasn't a merger. They like to say it was a merger, but his company bought our company. Well, yeah, that's how it goes. But yeah. but I, I, what I mean is that the two of you managed to come together to be together as a result of that. There's right. one other little fun point that kind of goes along that line. And that was, so it, Craig worked for Burroughs. I worked for Sperry. They merged to form Unisys. Ah. The, the, Michael Blumenthal was the person who put it together and Time Magazine had a picture of him in the article about the merger and the caption under it was matchmaker colon Michael Blumenthal. <laughs> wow. How true that was. And they didn't know. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Mark, I think, uh, you know, as Sue's saying, um, how do we do it? it yeah. If we met in a bar or something, it'd be completely fine if that happened. Mm -hmm. And if we started dating and fell in love, uh, that could be swimmingly um, going along. And then this thing like business would enter the mix. Oh, let's start a business together. And that would be a brand new experience somewhere midstream in the relationship. We never had that. You know, just from the get-go, we were, you know, people say, how long have you been in, in business? Our business is 23 years old, but we've been in business together for 38 when we first met. You know, and wow. it's always been. Mm -hmm. So, so I think we're lucky. Now, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean we don't get some credit for for not just circumstance, but how we communicate, how we mm -hmm. work together, how we figure out who's best at what. Uh, we have a concept called thinker, creator, doer. That's mm -hmm. about tendencies. We all have maybe one of those things we focus on or a couple of them that are a strength. I'm more of a thinker doer. So I'm the kind of guy that's visionary, big picture, and then pick up the phone, not much in between. Where Sue's a, a, a visionary creator, the one more likely to take the big picture to some sort of project plan that can be useful. And so we're aware of that. You know, we've learned each other's styles and make sure we're mm -hmm. alert to it and respect it and not try to make the other something they're not. Uh, I hope you won't take this uh, the wrong way when I say this, Craig, but th that's because you're a guy. <laughs> there's, there's, a, um, there's a brilliant video you can find on YouTube from a gentleman named Mark Gungor, G-U-N-G-O-R. Hmm. And he's talking about, he, he might call it a tale of two brains, I don't know, but it's about men's brains and women's brains. And he first starts out talking about men's brains. And he says, men's brains are comprised of boxes. Mm. And none of the boxes are ever allowed to touch another box. And so you can think of one thing at a time, and you just don't want anything else to interfere with that. And then, of course, he says, you know, there's, there's one box in there that we call the nothing box because there's nothing in it, and that's our favorite box. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then he starts talking about women's brains that are all like wired and all going all the time. But later in the presentation, he says that men always think that they have to fix things. Mm -hmm. So when our women, when our spouses are talking to us, do, 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 we're doing these calculations like, okay, something's wrong. What do, we, what do I have to do to fix it? And according to Mark Gongor, and I agree with him, what we should be doing is nothing except listening. So yeah, I, I, I think that's how you two have managed to strike the balance. And I thought, Craig, you were going to say, we're not perfect. We're um, not. But, not but. So what, <laughs> what I think you've managed to do is, as you suggested, recognize that each of you has different strengths and learn to work with them or put them to work for you 
rather than having them be sources of friction or bones of contention or something. I think that's fair, wouldn't you say, Sue? Mm-hmm. Yes. But you're right. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. You go first, because I'm going to take us down a slight ta- tangent. Okay. Good. Yeah. I love tangents. I, I had a thought, Sue, that as Mark was talking there, I wondered if some of what we do for a living now, we help individuals uh, live regretless lives. Right. And mm-hmm. that doesn't mean perfect. Like you said, Mark, nothing's perfect. Um. And one of the things that maybe we're all, I'm generalizing, we're all experiencing now, especially since COVID, is this thing we call an integrated life. Mm-hmm. The idea of a, a balanced life, work-life balance suggests opposing more of one is less of the other and they're back mm-hmm. and forth or perhaps at each other. And what we've discovered, and I think we maybe had a little leg up, is we've since we did grow up in the workplace together in our relationship, life was always, has always been what more and more of us are experiencing now. Work is play, is day, is night, is weekend, is weekday. Off time is on time. It's no longer these silos. Like you were talking about the boxes earlier, Mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's part of it is to realize that this is this thing called life. And if Mm -hmm. we want to label some of it work and some of it play and some of it free time and some of it work time, I think we make that stuff up. You know, this isn't so much about can we work together, it's our life together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is actually the first thing you said, Sue. Mm-hmm. So yes. please, and that's please. actually what I was going to say, is that I think that having worked together and having uh, and living together has has actually informed, influenced our work that we very often say, life and work can't be opposing forces. They're, it's mm-hmm. not a teeter-totter. Mm-hmm. It's it, it, life, work should be part of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of crazy. We actually had the same thought. Some, some years <laughs> ago, um, at least 20, I know that. It, it, it might even have been longer than that. I was talking to a friend who's in the coaching business as you are. And she said to me, you are not your work. Correct. And that didn't make sense to me then. And it doesn't make sense to me now. And, and I don't mean to suggest that I or anyone else are necessarily defined by our work. But if I were not me, if you were not you, your work wouldn't be what it is. And so how, I mean, how, how do I separate? How do we, how could we separate right. what we are and what our inclinations are from the work we do? I can't do it. I, I think the, maybe the, the premise or, or the baseline on that concept is that too often we identify with our titles. Oh, wow. And we identify with, you know, the, the status symbols, whether it's money or it's the house we buy or the car we drive or the, you know, th- th- that guy had suits and ties and because he was in sales. I mean, he had to have that image, but it's no longer, it wasn't, you know, we like nice things, you know, we, we, we love nice things, but we're not we also love the simple things. We love to just go sit in the lake or in the river, you know. We 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 the, it's it's not an either or. This is life's not binary in that way. There's very few things in my book that are binary in this world. You know, um something that breathes life into this uh, integrated picture of uh, life and work all together is a concept called ikigai that you might be familiar with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and you know your listeners may be familiar as well. And beautiful beautiful thing about ikigai is its its origin is in Eastern uh, Japanese culture, and it's it it's it's the way reason for being, and it's not uh, just about one thing or another. And there's four circles in the Venn diagram, at least the Western incarnation of ikigai, um, that 
whatever we do using our life force and our gifts, do we love it? Do we love it? Are we good at it? Those things aren't necessarily one and the same. They can mm -hmm. be. If they overlap, good. Better. They're not the same thing. And can we monetize it? Can we make a living doing it? And once again, if those things can overlap, that's a beautiful thing. Jim Collins back in the 90s would talk about those three circles, and I think he called hedgehog. Um, Ikigai adds the fourth. And uh, Mark, it sounds like you're nodding or looks like you're nodding. You know what that fourth circle is? I do not. The mm -hmm. world needs it now. The mm -hmm. world needs it now. If, if we could do something we love, we can be good at it and make money doing it. And oh, by the way, also, and the world needs it. We're doing something that brings meaning. Now we've got something. And, and so then that influences the rest of how we live as well how we live our being and and kind of going back to not being defined by our work yes our, our reason for being on this planet may be how we are compensated monetarily it also may not it may also just enable it i i uh, have to admit i struggle with that a little bit um um, and, and this, this may surprise you, but, um, a, a woman that I met through, um, b believe it or not, a, a book event that I did at a local Barnes and Noble, um, did an Akashic reading for me. And your Akashic record is, uh, you know, the, the way you've lived your life, um, mm -hmm. according to this, I think I'm in my. I think I'm in my 61st life, which is probably why I look so old. And uh, she also told me that um, in my 53rd life, I was a priest, which I suppose is no surprise because I'm an O'Brien. <laughs> um, but did she say what kind of priest? Did she say a Catholic priest? No, no, she didn't, and and <laughs> and and I didn't ask. Um, so I'm just going to take this tangent. There have been a couple of occasions, and gave me this cross she mm -hmm. had it made for me for one of my birthdays and there have been two occasions in the last i'm going to say two months in which i've been wearing a dark jersey with a a, a navy blazer and people have asked me if i'm a priest mm. um and if i were any faster i would have said yeah you want to tell me your confession <laughs> um so wh where where was i headed oh what this woman, Barbara, told me in the process of this reading was that I give too much away hmm. and that I should be paid for whatever hmm. it is that she thinks I'm giving away. So to your point, Sue, hmm. um, I think you're right. And I think I, I think that's something that I need to be better at. Hmm. You know, there's, there's no doubt. There's, there's no shame in the system that exists. We, Humans have invented these symbols we call money. When you think about yeah. it, it's all it's all fake. There's there's no intrinsic value of a fifty dollar bill. It's a piece of paper. Um, but we have we have a pact. We have an agreement that the symbols mean something. Mm -hmm. That's how we trade value. Mm -hmm. And so we don't go to the grocery store and persuade them <laughs> to give us food. We transact with money. There's certainly nothing wrong with it. I think it's a matter of degrees. It's a matter of emphasis. What is our relationship with money and what do we, and how do we characterize value and how do we trade it? And sometimes we don't need to have it be money and the ripples of impact can be not monetary. But what you're getting into, Mark, I think is a whole nother, you know, discussion around uh, how we and don't we define value and whatever we provide. And certainly all that philosophy you just said, I wouldn't advocate giving away your time or your expertise, because it's how the system works. We've gone through periods of guilt where it's like, oh, it doesn't feel right. Oh, geez, we shouldn't charge so much. We've discovered that sometimes when we're too prone to give in, it's the client who says, no, 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 <laughs> I want to pay. Oh, because that's how it works. I need your time and commitment. And Wow. You deserve to be remunerated. And our first gig ever as a company 23 years ago, mm -hmm. we were negotiated up. We were proposed 
we proposed we proposed our, our pricing and it was <clears> a <throat> friend and we're like oh geez you know if that rate's okay and the guy gets all he slams the table and said i'm not paying you that that rate that's too low <laughs> so we should charge what we're worth um were, were you all in the same room at the time I actually, I was not at the table at okay. that point. Yeah, because I was going to ask if you were in the room with that person, both of you, when that when he said it, I wondered if you resisted the urge to look at each other. Mm. Yeah, because I probably would have gone. <laughs> yeah, it was a great lesson. And he said, "By the way, it's, this is not altruistic. It's like, mm -hmm. look, we need your time and commitment. If you're if you're only charging that rate, uh, then you." it won't be fair to you. And then that will put everything out of balance. You need to be all in time and money. We need to be all in time and money. Yeah. He said, I think uh, he or another person, you, know, you then can't afford to put the amount of time in. That I need you to put in. That I need you to put in. Right. Right. So that was cool. I mean, that was a great lesson. So to your point, mm -hmm. you know, we were, we were taught by that friend and client. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, I'm not going to let you undersell yourself. That was a real gift to have that happen early on in the business. Um, I, I wrote a note, Craig, when you were talking about um, money as a symbol. Hmm. Uh, I had never thought about it as representational um, or abstract in any way. I suppose, you know, given the way the value of currency fluctuates, I, I probably should have. But But the one thing that did go through my mind is, you know, if you go if you go to the supermarket, um, after your order gets ring rung up, mm -hmm. there's always a little thing on the regardless of how you're paying that says, and it it doesn't say correct. It says, "Is this amount okay?" <laughs> and and I always want to ask. Oh, wait, hold on a minute. Th does anybody ever say no? <laughs> That's no, it's not okay. Point. I want it to be 20 bucks less. <laughs> I mean, what a crazy question. Well, you know, it was a very polite, deferential computer that you were dealing with. No, they all do that. They all do that. I mean, I'd, I'd feel better if it said, is it the amount correct? Next. <laughs> right? I mean, that's at least quantifiable. And it also reminds me of one time, I, I, actually, it wasn't, um, it wasn't in a grocery store. Do you have Marshalls where you are? Yes. I was in I was in Marshalls and there was an elderly woman in front of me and she was paying with a card. So I guess she was trying to put in her pin and it, it, it wasn't working. So she started banging on the thing. And and the young man who was behind the cash register said, uh, ma'am, it's thermal. You, you you don't have to bang at it. And she looks at me and she goes, Well, I must not be thermal enough. I thought that was a great <laughs> That was a great line. That's good. I have to remember that one. Yeah, I'm not thermal enough. <laughs> I'm not I, thermal I know enough. we're probably bumping up to a break pretty soon here, but uh, you know, the, the one of the things we learned in our coaching business, we mostly coach now, we also consult, but it's shifted increasingly to coaching one-on-one -on -one individuals. Relationship with money is a biggie. And there, there are different scripts that we have. Um, one expert about this was talking about there's a, a money avoidance script so we end up vilifying people who make money. Rich people are jerks. There's a kind of narrative that is essentially at root avoidance of money out of fear and a bad tape from childhood, maybe. There's money worship. I'll be valued and valuable when. There's, there's miserly scripts. I'm going to save it all until I die. Hmm. And then there's a status script. I associate my identity with my car, my money, my W-2. It's been a real hot topic lately because after COVID, clients are like, what am I doing this in my life? It used to be about the title and the pay and the and compensation. And now other things matter more. Yeah. Um, I, I want to come back to, to title and pay in, in a moment, but and and I'll I'll pause here for the break, but I just want to say. Uh, I didn't ask you at the beginning if you have Netflix, but given what you were just saying, Craig, about money, if you do have Netflix, I highly recommend you watch Mr. McMahon. Um, mm. th there's, there's, there's at least one screw loose in there. And 
I know money is one of that guy's drivers. And I know without doubt, yeah. ego is another one. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, I'm really not sure what drives that man. It, it, it's mm-hmm. kind of incredible. And I'm saying this as someone who's been watching his product since my sons, who are now 41 and 38, were kids. And our Saturday morning ritual was to watch WWF mm-hmm. in our underwear. Um, and to, 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 to be able to rethink what we were watching then in terms of this documentary mm-hmm. is just, it's just mind boggling. Check it out for sure. Okay. So let's just pause here for our artificial break and then we'll keep going. Everybody has a story. Everyone's story deserves to be told. And the only bad stories are the ones we don't share. That's why Mark O'Brien created The Anxious Voyage. It's Mark's conviction that every story deserves to be shared, and his purpose is to give people in all walks of life from any circumstances a chance to tell their stories. The Anxious Voyage is now on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network every Monday at 1 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Time, with live broadcast every first and third Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Please tune in, please join Mark, and please share your stories. Ever wonder what it's like to have your own radio show? Well, wonder no longer, because you can dip into the radio airwaves by being host for the day on syndicated Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. It's a fabulous way to get your radio feet wet. It's an opportunity to market your business, modality, or book. Have a guest, mention a sponsor, and take callers. Or you may want to facilitate a lesson by going solo. It's up to you. Listeners can be online, mobile, in cars with Bluetooth, or listen through Amazon's Echo by asking Alexa, play Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. For more details, go to DreamVision7Radio.com and click on Host for the Day. You can't establish your brand's authority without a voice. That's why, since 2004, O'Brien Communications Group, OCG, has been helping companies establish their authority, find their brands, distinct voices, and position their brands effectively and persuasively. So effectively that nine of OCG's clients have been acquired by other companies. OCG's business model emphasizes efficiency and results, not hourly billing, markups, and media commissions. That ensures OCG's advice is unbiased and its clients aren't at financial risk. If you're ready to find your voice and use it to tell your story, OCG is ready to help. You can find O'Brien Communications Group on the web at O'BrienCG.com. That's O-B-R-I-E-N-C-G.com. Or call 860-944-9022. Calling all authors. Have you been considering an audiobook? Well, look no further. Come take advantage of Dream Vision 7 Radio Network's unique in house audiobook production, which includes benefits and bonuses from our radio station. Let our knowledgeable staff guide you to create the audiobook you've always dreamed of without breaking the bank. Check out our full one stop service from A to Z, including the ACX process. Schedule a free consultation by calling 508 226 1723. That's 508 226 1723. Or go to dreamvision7radio.com. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. Okay, so um, what I wanted to say briefly about titles is um, there were numerous occasions in my corporate life in which I wanted to ask particular people if, if this organization that we are in didn't tell you that you're up here and you have this title, what would you be like and how would you act toward people? Because I, I still think, and I, I think I've seen it as recently as the past few months, I think something happens when people get above a certain level in an organization I don't know if they change. I don't know if they become more fearful. Mm. I don't know if their values change. 
maybe their motivations change. Um, and, and I will just add this. I don't know if you saw a piece that Dennis published for me quite some time ago called I Am You. But mm -hmm. I happened to see a picture on um, Pixabay of, a, of a, a black and white photo of a homeless man. And when I saw his eyes, this picture just, I mean, sorry, this piece just wrote it. It, it wrote itself. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I was writing it as if I were that person, but that person sees a young man absolutely dressed to the nines and is imagining that that young man is miserable. And that young man was me because I was dressed to the nines and I was miserable. So what is it? What is it that you make of that? I'll just refer to it as a hierarchical change. Do you see it? Sue, what are your thoughts there? Well, I think it's dangerous to paint with a broad brush and say, this is what always happens or they change. Thank you for reminding me of that. Often what we've seen, what we've read, studied, um, is that when people become managers, become leaders and become lead. And, and I hesitate with that because to me, a leader is not, is not the title, Yep. but when they get to a hierarchy, they, they now have responsibilities where their personal excellence, they can't just go and do it, right? They have to lead other people, inspire other people. There's fear can step in. They feel like they have to have all the answers and their answers have to be correct, right? They have to have the correct answer for others. They take on like way too much responsibility, too much weight on the shoulders rather than saying, you know what? That's a great question. I don't have the answer to that. How do you think we could figure that out or who should we go to? Or to say, hmm, and this is, you know, I'm going to give Jim Smith a big kudos here. Um, the three solution rule, right? So someone comes to you with a question. How do I do this? What should I do? Flip it back. Give me th at least, give me three possibilities of how we could handle this. Tell me which one you think is the best mm -hmm. and help me understand why and why the others aren't. Now you have people starting to think for themselves, starting to reason through. They're starting, you, and, and as as the the leader, the manager, you start to understand how they think and reason and their judgment. You get better clarity. You start to see their motivations. It, it, it and it, rather than the manager leader having to have the answer, the correct answer, the right answer. And even when you think about movies and books, right? Our superhero always has this wild, crazy, right answer. They're always right. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it goes back to our schooling. You had temporary rote memorization and, and, and in college, is this going to be on the final? Oh. <laughs> right? But, but we had to have the right answer. We had to have the right grade. Rather than, it, that just reinforced that sense of, I, I, I can't be wrong. Mm, and so it. to be, yeah, so to be able to say, I don't know, is almost the first thing a new leader, and especially a leader of leader, needs to learn. And then that that permeates with everyone that I don't have to, even if I'm not the manager, I don't have to be right. I just need to be able to say I need help. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're speaking to, Sue, and I think we've seen with our with our clients, because mm -hmm. a lot of our clients are uh, emerging into leader of leader roles, mm -hmm. uh, inclusive of the session I had today with a client. And it, it's timely we're having this conversation because the... The idea of hierarchy is what quite often enters the mix, right? We're thinking about superior subordinate. It's 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 not such a vertical thing. It's a shift, maybe right to left, in the sense of of role shift. The difference between authority and influence. 
the difference between individual contribution and a manager, the difference between manager and leader. All these things sound like semantic academia, mm -hmm. but there's mm -hmm. fundamental things mm -hmm. we've discovered change. Mm -hmm. We go from tell to ask, from do to think, from self to other, from me to we, to hear, to listen, from now to vision, from instruct to inspire. All these things are shifting at these levels you're speaking to, Mark. So it's like, it's a different role, not right. so much higher or lower. It's different. Right. And and that's something that Craig and I have talked about with each other often is that is, is the sense that we do set our company organization, our org charts top to bottom. And I don't know if it should be left to right, right to left, but it's about emphasis. Is it personal execution, detail work, or is it more systems, whole system, visionary, leading, seeing the whole picture, and then you get granular, whichever way you want to go. But it's not about, there's power, there's influence, there's authority, the power of influence, the power of authority, um, and the leader is not necessarily the person with the title. Right. Mm. Oh, that's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I had it to do over again um, with O'Brien Communications Group, mm -hmm. I, I never would have put my name on the proverbial door. Mm -hmm. um, I, didn't, I didn't realize the extent to which that would be limiting um, and, and even though I fought the idea or, or the impression of hierarchy by giving everyone who's come to work with me, the title partner, mm -hmm. um, and that worked a little bit, but clients still have the sense that if they're not talking to me, they're talking to O'Brien light. Um, mm. and I, I wish I had known that 20, 20 some odd years ago, but I didn't. Um, and two other things, and you can tell me if I'm nuts, but uh, I've always said to everybody who's come to work here, one, you're not being paid to say yes to me. And two, I will ask them still and frequently, if they ask me a question, what would you do if I weren't here? Mm. Mm, good one. And if they answer the question, we'll talk it through. And mm -hmm. More times than not, they're correct. And regardless of what I thought, their way was better. And that, you, to, to your point, Craig, that's why I make a distinction between leadership and management. Mm -hmm. um, can you go give a little, share a little bit more on that about their ways? Often their idea was usually, or often sometimes better. Um. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do it in general terms. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there have been times um, when when my inclination would have been to take harder lines with people, mm. and it will be suggested to me um, that that's not necessary. And uh, I'll, I'll use a term from Joanna. She will say to me sometimes, you know what, what he really needs is a glass of warm milk. And, and then she'll resolve it. Successfully you, talking me off the ledge, so to speak. Do you think they had more detail or a, about the a, situation about, yeah. an understanding that you didn't have. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think that's probably so. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that I've thought about it before, but now that you've prompted me, I think I think it's because day to day mm -hmm. we, we have different concerns. And Joanne, I'll just continue to use her as the example. She she's much closer mm -hmm. to that day to day interaction with with our clients. Um, I don't have as much time as I would like to do this, but but I'm trying to think at a more strategic level mm. and she's involved very much 
tactically. And sometimes that's part of it is that, yeah. you know, the, the responsibilities you have are on a different time schedule than someone else might be at. So Bingo. you're trying to like, oh, and now you get something that feels like a curveball and help me make a decision now, Mark. And it's like, okay, fine, just do it this way because it's fast. And it's like, eh, maybe that's not the end we want, right? That's efficient, not necessarily the effectiveness we wanted. Yeah, and I also think, you know, sometimes I say that um, some people are born without the urgency gene. Mm. Um, I think my dad gave me two of them. <laughs> so I, I think I probably tend to, well, in hindsight, I can say overreact because mm. sometimes I think things need to be done now and they don't. Mm. There's a, so some, uh, sometimes bit pers personality and sometimes um, it's, the role and responsibilities of that role can yeah. also, yeah. Yeah. What were you going to say, a, Greg? Uh, I was about to mention a, a friend of mine named Moby. Um, hmm. And I chatted a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about how do we protect our energy? He's basically got two, two work lives. His employers allowed him to have his own enterprise and he's trying to figure out how to balance that. So he does the due diligence diligence in the office and, and we we're comparing notes. I'm like, how, how do you manage all that? And he's studied it. He's re read a couple books. One is called Slow Productivity. Uh, mm. And it's all about what to do and when to do nothing, when to say no, when not to respond, when not to be urgent in order to be able to focus on the important. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of counterintuitive stuff. The author, uh, just read the early part of the book, was begging the question, what's with that productivity thing? I mean, really, let's just dissect why do we assume without even questioning what productivity means and why it matters? Does it really? If so, what does it really take to be productive? Run around in circles and making a thousand phone calls and answering all your instant messages ain't the way to do it. And he talks mm. about how to actually stop some of that frantic activity trap. Um, b back in the the day, the late 90s, I guess, <clears throat> I worked for a small uh, public relations agency. And we, we had a client that was in commercial construction. And I, I couldn't even tell you how many press releases these folks wanted us to crank out on a regular basis. And I actually had editors of the publications to which we were sending these press releases say to me, if you send me one more from that company, I'm never going to carry anything that they send again. And that's when I learned the difference between output versus outcomes. If you're yeah. more inclined to, to judge productivity, to use your term, Craig, mm -hmm. if you're more likely to judge that by output rather than outcomes, you may not have lost your way, but it's getting slippery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll remember that phrase for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's, let's take our next fake break right <laughs> here. <laughs> and uh, actually when we, when we come back, um, I want to pick up with distinction dialogues because <laughs> I just love everything about that. Are you ready for the quantum age? Humanity's next step in evolution? Dream Vision 7 Radio Network invites you to the extraordinary platform of evolutionary voices for the quantum age. Let's explore. Learn more about this upcoming age where we bridge science with spirituality. Where potentiality meets reality. Where we take compassion into action. Our trailblazers and visionaries will ask the whys, the what ifs, while igniting continuous possibility. Come along with us into an age beyond what we know today, where we can grow together in unity consciousness. Experience evolutionary voices for the quantum age, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern on DreamVision7Radio.com.
You can't establish your brand's authority without a voice. That's why since 2004, O'Brien Communications Group, OCG, has been helping companies establish their authority, find their brands, distinct voices, and position their brands effectively and persuasively. So effectively that nine of OCG's clients have been acquired by other companies. OCG's business model emphasizes efficiency and results, not hourly billing, markups, and media commissions. That ensures OCG's advice is unbiased and its clients aren't at financial risk. If you're ready to find your voice and use it to tell your story, OCG is ready to help. You can find O'Brien Communications Group on the web at O'BrienCG.com. That's O-B-R-I-E-N-C-G.com. Or call 860-944-9022. Calling all authors. Have you been considering an audiobook? Well, look no further. Come take advantage of Dream Vision 7 Radio Network's unique in house audiobook production, which includes benefits and bonuses from our radio station. Let our knowledgeable staff guide you to create the audiobook you've always dreamed of without breaking the bank. Check out our full one stop service from A to Z, including the ACX process. Schedule a free consultation by calling 508 226 1723. That's 508 226 1723. Or go to dreamvision7radio.com. Everybody has a story. Everyone's story deserves to be told. And the only bad stories are the ones we don't share. That's why Mark O'Brien created The Anxious Voyage. It's Mark's conviction that every story deserves to be shared, and his purpose is to give people in all walks of life, from any circumstances, a chance to tell their stories. The Anxious Voyage is now on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network every Monday at 1 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Time, with live broadcast every first and third Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Please tune in, please join Mark, and please share your stories. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. Okay, so uh, maybe the best way to start this, Craig, is just to ask you what Distinction Dialogues is and how it came about. Well, there's a there's a is was answer to the question. Probably more meaningful is the what it might become and what we're still discovering about it. And I think that's been part of it is is we haven't really set forth. Here's what it is, and here's what it's got to be. It's a organic evolving animal as we speak, even though we've done about a dozen of them. Um, but I would like to not answer that question and defer to Sue, because I think the story about how it became something in the first place at all begins with a story. Okay. And I don't know what story you're about to tell. Um, Erie, Isle, Erie, Erie Isle Coffee Shop, Jim Smith. Well, well Distinction Dialogues, I that's, know. you know, it was you and, and Mac. So in some ways, when you keep saying we, it's you and Mac. And oh, I'm just kind you. of the, I'm just kind of the tag along on that. Oh, I know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there was a, there was a time and, um, okay. Um, it's a client, a former client of ours, a very dear friend He's the one that got us into coaching. We were consulting, helping him on the business side. And then in learning about the business, we both were like, what is this? And Craig actually asked him, how do you get into coaching? Okay. And Jim's reply was, you begin coaching. Okay. So, <laughs> but here we were and, um, <laughs> I'm witness to this. Uh, we, we were working on a, uh, some, actually some books for him and we we weren't getting the response necessarily that we wanted uh, and the timeline so when we met he's like so what's the status and we're not at that point we had to tell him and he said why not and we had to very we were very gingerly in trying to let him know that 
it's because we didn't get the response from you that we needed. And you know, because you can imagine Mark being in your world, the content that we were working on started with him. So we needed to volley back and forth and yep. we, we needed material from him in order to do something, give material back to him. Right. Yep. And yeah, we call and, it source material. Yeah, mm -hmm. And he just said, well, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you push me more? Well, we, you know, maybe did a couple, but then we just, we were being nice and not pushing too hard. And he said, he's, you have to understand, Jim is like the sweetest guy. He's so, not a table slammer. such a big heart. He slams the table. And he said, if you ever do that again, you're fired. He said, there's a difference between nice and kind. There it is. And that Craig was telling the story to our friend Mac. Mm -hmm. And he and Mac were like, oh, let's, let's, let's explore different words. Let's explore this. So the distinction dialogue, right? Two words. And, and so it just was born. And so, Sue, so you're, you're uh, gracious. Yes, Mac and I probably do most of the lift on that, but you're very much yeah. part of it. The three of us really are emerging into our roles. So it's the three of us for sure. So in, in you know, if the listener is like, I still don't get it. What is it? Is it an event? Is it a show? <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of everything yes. in that sense. So we, we purposely decided, um, you know, when we were faced with the, the choice around, do we do something live like we're doing right now with you? Mark, um, is it output broadcast only? Is it participative? If there's participation, is it via chat? How do we make that work? And we decided to do both. The answer is yes. Let's have a uh, outbound broadcast, so to speak. Mac and I, Mac Bogart and I, uh, riff about two words that are like sort of the same that we're assuming they're same that we use quite often, but they're not. And then when we dig a little deeper, we find out how everyone has slightly different connotations and definitions of words we use often. Things, you know, especially in business, innovation, collaboration, positive energy, leadership, all these things have different meaning to different people. And so it, it, it's illustrated. We have discussion about these words, and then we have a group discussion via Zoom thereafter. So we can all talk about it. There's a couple of things we uncover. Assumptions are rampant. Definitions are unclear. Jumping to conclusions happens all the time in human mm. communication. Mm. And is it worth it to spend an hour, hour and a half dissecting two words? That sounds like a waste of time. It's not. Thanks mm. to your testament, Mark. It's really cool how uh, you've helped breathe life with your enthusiasm and participation and the dialogues. And uh, we're still figuring out what it's going to become. I, I appreciate you saying that because my sense... Actually, I think I want to say sensation mm. in participating in those things is that I've had new life like spun into my head. Well, I, I never thought about it that way, or I never would have considered that, or the, these are assumptions I make. These are terms I take for granted. Um, so that that's why I enjoy those shows, appreciate those shows so much, because they always make me think differently. Mm. And Mark, if they do, and that's gratifying to hear and know, and if it's an enjoyable experience intellectually or otherwise, it's wonderful. What's the usefulness of that in your mind? Like, why does that matter in our society that we do that more? Um, well, I, I think I can offer you two perspectives. The first one is entirely personal. I, I live in absolute fear of my dense streak. And sometimes when people tell me things that I've just managed not to see at all, I start laughing. And when I do, I'm always afraid that people are going to think I'm being, oh, I don't know, haughty or, or dismissive or something. I'm laughing at the fact that I'm such a moron that something was this close to my being able to see it, but I never did. So that, that's the personal response. The, mm. the, the, the bigger response is, I, I just think that we would all be better off if we took the time to engage in the conversations that, that you and Mac inspire. And you too, Sue, I'm not letting you off the hook here. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. With those with those sessions, 
Um, so I, I don't know that we're necessarily right at this moment running out of time, and I know this is going to be edited. I want to share a story with you, but first I want to make sure that we get in the recording how people can learn about these sessions and how they can get in touch with both of you. Um, a, so they can just plain contact you because they should, and B, so that they can find out about uh, Cat Strat and what you do professionally, but also see how they can get involved if they would like to in mm. distinction dialogues. Um, you know, Thanks, you said Mark. 90 to 60 minutes. To, to, to my way of thinking, that is time well and gratefully spent on my part. So the one thing we didn't get to is kind of how it flows. I think, Craig, you started with it, and that is that Craig and Mac kind of riff for 30 minutes live on LinkedIn Live. And then whomever wants to, we will then go to, and in the meantime, we're taking chat and we'll, I'll pop the questions up for the two guys to, to chat about. And then we go to Zoom and we'll, and that's just whoever's there. But the con the comments continue on LinkedIn. So it's probably best that it's, you know, to contact us to find out about Distinction Dialogues is, is on LinkedIn. And I'm going to let Craig give the details on how. Yeah. And well, and, and these run about every month or so. And if you're, if you're a leader, a manager, a business owner, a human, um, you might find it in interesting. We've covered things like uh, power versus control, order versus chaos, rhythm versus routine, intimacy and proximity. Um, so it's the gamut. One way to get involved is, is there, if there's a concept, a couple pairs, uh, of words that make you curious, let us know. How do you let us know? As Sue was describing, there's distinction dialogues, the group on LinkedIn. So if you're active on LinkedIn, do a search on that group. You'll find it. The discussion streams there, the archives of the, uh, events are there. And then, uh, heads up on what's coming up next in terms of our business, uh, as consultants and coaches, strategists, and uh, executive slash career slash life coaches, if that's something yeah. that piques someone's interest. Uh, Catalyst Strategies is actually the name of our firm, uh, formed in 2001. We found that hard to spell, type, and remember and, uh, and say uh, without a tongue twist. So we became nicknamed Cat Strat for Catalyst Strategies, cat hyphen strat, S-T-R-A-T dot com. And then there's a, a messaging system there on our website either of those. So LinkedIn or cat-strat.com. And I will also add that um, Cat Strat was mentioned in a book and <laughs> I put a hyperlink to the chapter in which you're discussed in the show description on Dream Vision 7 radio. Mm -hmm. So if thank you're interested you. in that, you can go see that. So I'm, I'm going to close out here by saying thank you to the two of you. Um, and for everyone who was here with us live and who will watch the recordings later, and I will be back on the first Monday in November for our next show. So thank you. Thank you for tuning into The Anxious Voyage, the program dedicated to sharing stories, helping people, and celebrating life. You can see and listen to The Anxious Voyage on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network every Monday at 1 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Time with live broadcast every first and third Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. If you have a story to tell or if you know someone who does, please email the host, Mark O'Brien, at mark at o'briencg.com. In the meantime, please remember, the only bad stories are the ones we don't share. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow.